The stories surrounding the topic how I got to know Metal Gear are extremely different and absolutely amusing to hear. I heard tens and tens of stories how people got to know Metal Gear Saga. Some started from MGS3, MGS4 and, believe it or not, even portable installments. There is something incredibly engrossing in Metal Gear Universe what makes people go deeper in learning everything about these games, how they were produced and how characters develop throughout the whole series. It was a year between 1998 and 2001 when parents brought me PS1 with a couple of games along with it. At that time, Sony had been adding demo discs into PS1 packages as a marketing practice, and there were tons and tons of variations of these demo discs. They contained playable gameplay demos and those awesome trailers of upcoming games. It was for that lucky chance my PS1 had a demo disc with MGS1 trailer. To say that I was completely blown away means to say nothing. I've never seen anything more spectacular and exciting, primarily because this trailer contained everything a young boy needed at that period of time. An awesome looking character, some sort of spy, who infiltrates a snowbound base which is guarded by camouflage soldiers. In this short trailer there was even an epic fight between this bandana guy and ninja guy, and I actually thought that ninja was the protagonist. And then everything on the screen was blown up by C4. After some time, maybe in 2006, during summer vacations, a friend of mine came to me and gave me a disc and said, hey, have a look at this one. And when I inserted a disc in my PS1, that was it. It was this game from Demo Trailer. It was Metal Gear Solid. Basically, that's where it all started. I was blown away by every little thing this game was presenting to me. Fantastic voice acting, weather effects, titles which ran along the game screen while you were waiting for the elevator. Of all things, it was a game where you could smoke cigarettes by your own free will. So my interest to MGS franchise started there. Learning about spy equipment, secret developments, reading wiki about every character of the saga, watching numerous walkthroughs before walkthroughs on YouTube were even popular, then reading about Cold War, getting the wrong Metal Gears for portable systems, then getting the right ones and finally, completing them all personally, helping each other in co-op, learning the backstory of each character, of each tragedy behind the villain or a hero, learning the process of these games being made, and be amazed how quite a small group of dedicated people are creating single storyline for more than 25 years. So this is just one of those thousands and thousands of stories of how people got to know Metal Gear Solid, and that was my personal one. I'll be extremely happy to hear how you got to know MGS, how did it turn out for you? But not long time ago, reminiscing the history of Metal Gear Saga, I asked myself, what is the main grip? What is the main link of this 30-year-old chain that brings people to experience such vastly different projects ranging from Metal Gear Solid 1 in 1998 and say Peace Walker from 2010? To answer this question, it is important to look at the picture at broader scale. The MGS's franchise process of development and its structure in terms of gameplay and its delivery to the player from 1987 up to 2015 is a good example why these games are so endearing. All of the game entries conceptually and thematically different between each other. Each development process of each installment started with fundamentally variable goals, and it's not a very popular type of strategy in this industry. Generally, when sales beat the costs, game studios tend to expand on existing success, they don't generally change the basic formula. They add a couple of new details, buff the action to some degree and make a sequel a little bit prettier than the predecessor. Of course I don't mean that these projects are bad or anything like it. Game development is always a game of risks and conflicts of interests. 
choosing priorities, managing budgets and ideas, but when it comes to Metal Gear franchise, I do believe it is a different and unique story. As I said, all of the MGS games are conceptually and also technologically different between each other, and it is something the studio should be praised for. You can always find Kojima's personal touch, his inner emotions and his specific frame of mind that he put into his creation when you explore any of the installments. On the one hand, there is MGS1, which is totally different from MSX Metal Gears, and almost repeats the story of Metal Gear 2, but in 3D format. It treats main character as a warmonger, and treats its story as a Hollywood action flick. On the other hand, there is MGS2, that made phenomenal technical step forward compared to its predecessor. The game took absolutely different approach to its story and presented meta-narrative experience to the viewer. To the player. You are given a role of a side character in the Shadow of the Legend. The game asked audience a lot of serious questions about their future, and these questions happen to be relevant 17 years after the release and probably will be relevant in the years to come. And then there is Metal Gear Solid 3, which goes back in terms of time period and presents Dusty Spy Chronicle of the Cold War Hero, accompanies it with old fashioned music and spy film references, switching the surrounding areas from narrow metal corridors to unknown and dangerous Siberian jungles. And then there is MGS4, which puts player into the heart of the battlefield, grabs all of the emotions of previous installments and characters, and erupts it into one action sequence after another, and basically finishes the whole saga, giving most of the characters a sense of finale. And finally, there is Metal Gear Solid V, which tried to be all-out open-world game. The fact that all of these styles, plot structures existed in one storyline is outright phenomenal. Even subplots as Portable Ops and Peace Walker tie into the lore with great attention to detail and love for the characters. The author, the locomotive of creativity of MGS, Hideo Kojima, is definitely an outstanding person. The way he crafts characters and their stories is amazing. Almost every character in the game has some sort of background story, which generally tends to be tragic and very touching. Every character has motivation to act like he or she does and every image of any given character is backed by outstanding visual design by Yoji Shinkawa. Even more often, some characters' stories can be learned just by looking at the attributes of their clothes, their voice, accents, and surrounding areas. But what's more important is how Kojima's work exists without his necessary guidance. I might say the most basic thing ever, but it'd still be relevant. Metal Gear Solid's story, at its basis, is a story about people, about people with formed characters, with emotional backgrounds which dovetail with viewers' heartbeats, and raises questions of morality, meaning of friendship, love and loyalty, all those immortal and sane things. People at any given age can relate to at least one of the characters in the saga, a villain or a hero. The viewer can find something relatable from a bright side of his life or maybe a dark one. Moments of anger, joy and sadness. The villains generally have a reason to do what they do. They often happen to be victims of events, victims of psychological traumas that brought them to do things we consider bad. And just for instance, some of the characters presented as villains in MGS might not always be them. And that's another great moment of humanity in these games which makes up for a very solid and in most cases cohesive story. But I really wanted to emphasize the value of this element. Despite the fact that MGS series is full of futuristic and downright fantastic elements, you still believe in what's happening on the screen. And due to this human factor of the characters, the inhuman abilities which are given to them acquire some sort of romantic scent which graces them even more. When it comes to Metal Gear franchise, what would be the most memorable thing which comes to your mind, aside from characters? I'd certainly say that this element is the locations where characters interact. Because those are not just gameplay arenas to sneak around and do stuff, but rather fully developed, explored and almost substantive areas with a purpose to them and story behind each corner. Their beauty is again backed by stunning visual and audio design which differs from one installment to another. On the one hand there are cold, dark, creaky inner and outer sectors of Shadow Moses base. When you crawl inside ditches of nuclear facility, you can hear wolves howling and rusty metal constructions keep frightening you every second. And it's absolutely amusing how Big Shell is the opposite. It's calm and peaceful outside. 
Metal Gear Solid, in my humble opinion, has its own, sort of, the most central location in the series. Some sort of bridge which connects everything the player stumbled upon in the past and which foresees great events which will happen in the future. I think one might call it the heart of Metal Gear. It is a specific location in Metal Gear Solid 3, the Granite's Cabinet. The cabinet itself is full of references. You can see Zone of the Ender's Toy on a bookshelf, another project created by Kojima Studio. You can also see Metal Gear Ray from MGS2, a portrait of Rykov, which is an easter egg of Raiden in the first place. Everything in this cabinet, including dialogues, has some sort of starting point. What is a starting point, you might ask? Well, upon meeting with Engineer Granin, Snake is told about this idea of a bipedal tank, which is being called Metal Gear. And it's the first time in Saga's time period where this name is brought up, and it's the first time the protagonist repeats it in a question form. Metal Gear. Granin also mentions that he is about to send engineering plans to his American friend, and this friend happens to be Hugh Emmerich, whom we can see later on Granin's photo. Not only that, but the whole scene is also accompanied by jazz version of the main theme, Old Metal Gear. This fantastic scene establishes connection to future plot elements of MGS1 and MGS2, and also MGS4, in game's timeline. And at the same time, it reminisces MGS1 and MGS2, in terms of time when those games were developed. Even more so, it is a ground zero of two different worlds of East and West, which clashed in the middle of 20th century. It is a ground zero of the biggest conflict in Metal Gear Saga, Metal Gear. Being Russian myself, <laughs> I absolutely adore this sort of Soviet caricature of Granin and the appearance of Russian characters in MGS3 in general. Its serious tone in terms of story is colorfully diluted by these forms of stereotypes of Soviet culture and musical presentation. And to top it off, the main theme converted into lounge and jazz soundtrack softens this scene in an absolutely magnificent way. I can go on and on about other fantastic details this series share, but first of all, you all know them, and if you don't, I strongly believe it must be experience on your own. So by the end it all comes to the last installment, MGS5. Fantastically enough, one of the most surprising and unique things you could have got from MGS5 was the wait. Yes, the awaiting of MGSV was an experience in of itself. It was almost a metaphysical, a phantom experience, and there is a very strong reasoning behind this sort of hype that many people shared, and why this sort of emotional impact can never be achieved, probably never in this industry. And the reason is the following. There is simply no other story existing in the frame of nearly 30 years. Just give it a think. 30 years. It's almost a frame of human generation, and just like the generation of humans, it is a generation of characters in the saga. That is why trailers from MGSV stroke so deep into viewers' hearts. Most of these trailers, but primarily I'm speaking about the E3 2013 trailer, it accumulates all of the possibilities for the characters to finally be established, to finally answer to their inner demons, inner imperfections because the characters that appeared there have been growing alongside players. They, just like us, were transforming, living through their own stories, and players were the actual participants of creating these stories. But going back to the emotional part. For the reasons I've mentioned earlier, the last installment, although being beautifully crafted in many ways, is so much less engaging. It's in a way feels empty and abandoned, in other words, soulless. The basic premise of creating historical and memorable locations shifted to more gameplay-oriented level design. And this absence of life is also reinforced by the lack of information given to each particular area. To be completely fair with you, I'd say that the last cohesive area that acted as a character itself was Camp Omega in Ground Zeroes. Not only it is a place where many faiths are unraveled, the camp was also a reference to a real-life Delta camp at Guantanamo which makes it even more intriguing and thought-provoking in regards to real-life politics. From the gaming standpoint, Ground Zeroes is also a fantastic example of how close bits of the story can coexist with vastly different hardware. And here I mean shift from portable Peace Walker to next-gen MGS5. And despite the tonal shift in story presentation, which for some people is seen as a negative element, I strongly believe it's another thing that you can admire in Metal Gear Saga. It can be versatile, different in mood and its expressions, but it's what makes gaming industry a unique type of media. 
Kojima no secret tends to accumulate different bits and pieces of music and films that he knows to his own projects. A known fact, the sort of motto he lives by is 70% of my body is made of movies. And that's one of those observable things people can take from his works. Sometimes Hideo takes these references and inspiration too simple, too direct, but nonetheless it's a genuine interest and passion towards accumulating knowledge about films and implementing them into his own creation, what makes it admirable and memorable. It will be absurd to say that different references in Metal Gear Saga should be considered plagiarism, because how much creators enrich these references in their own way? That's one of many possible routes how you can envision art. You admire works of different artists, reimagine their concepts and in the end create something on your own. But one of major issues which I have with any MGS game is the legacy. Gaming industry itself is a different kind of media. The technological progress in gaming industry makes a step forward every year, platform generation changes rapidly, and many different projects seem to be destined to be forgotten. The projects in gaming industry are, well, sorta of locked up in technological trap. I think it's quite naive to think that remakes and remasters is the best solution. First of all, because you can't expect remastering every decent game. Many companies don't find it very profitable and reasonable. And secondly, a lot of remasters, as evidence shows, happen to be quite bad. Upscaling graphical fidelity, draw distance, texture resolution and so on sometimes might hurt the natural initial experience. And the reason for that is whenever a game, primarily I mean potentially a very good game, is created, game developers build their ideas on existing technologies and work around technological constraints, which are tied directly to final result. One of the best examples of this form of design that being implemented is presented on your screen right now. That is why remasters and remakes can rarely achieve the excellence of initial experience. They may gain a little bit from the performance standpoint, but lose in crucial details. I do however want to state that sometimes ideas of remakes actually work, when developers decide to build a game from the scratch, which makes it basically a different game, a different experience altogether. And I'm genuinely happy to witness that these projects exist nowadays. They often tribute the originals in a beautiful way, often replicating visuals, atmosphere and charisma with enormous attention to detail. But does it mean that every good remake is necessarily a perfect substitute to the original? Let me take films and games as an analogy. I'll take this analogy because it's the closest one to what games are nowadays, cinematic and focused on direction. Whenever you watch an old film, you simply sit back and watch the entertaining story. You can look over some obvious technical disadvantages due to time period when film was created, Generally, we watch old films because of the interesting script writing, acting and direction, often to remember what cinematography looked like back then, admire the style and era of filmmaking. But unlike good old films, good old games can get outdated. Because besides the story, games do have gameplay. And in most cases of classic games, you have to physically come to terms with gameplay constraints, graphical constraints and other limitations. Every new generation of consoles pushes away games from past generation, and that's what I meant by technological trap. Gaming industry, being investment and consumer oriented, has its own risks to face. The majority of player population is interested in technological advances each coming year. The major focus is generally put towards innovation in visuals, in size of playable areas, and other great, yet often temporarily admirable things. Each year, AAA segment of industry is in need of bigger investments, thus forcing developers to act safe, consumer-friendly, to be mass-oriented and implement unpleasant, to say the least, pain game mechanics that all players know and don't like. Unlike classic films, classic games are bound to be pushed back by new projects, which are objectively richer in terms of graphics and progress, but in many many times not in terms of their essence. It is quite possible that in not distant future players won't be able to experience MGS from PS1 era and then from PlayStation 2 generation. We can go on and on. This legacy slowly starts to gather dust on older hardware. Less and less people naturally will have an ability to experience Metal Gear Solid Journey when PS3 and Xbox 360's time comes to its inevitable end. The gaming industry is still young, it grows rapidly and who knows what we might have in the nearest future. Steam and couple of other game libraries happen to keep many of those classic projects in one secluded digital depot, so to speak. But we all know that market is oriented on console industry. Maybe when Kojima dies there will be a separate game server where you could visit his digital grave and watch all the games he made with his team, I don't know. But I hope you got my point. 
Uh, in the end, I honestly didn't want to finish this emotional talk on sad emotion. So, all this analysis aside, when it comes to the final result, an enormous amount of effort is concentrated in creators' hands. It's in their talent and understanding to find perfect balance between making experience applicable in years to come and at the same time carrying project's idea to the contemporary viewers. And I strongly believe that Metal Gear Saga is one of those rare examples, when gameplay aspects can feel old-fashioned and fresh at the same time, when visual presentation and direction still shine after all those years, when you don't regret a second of learning about these stories that blossom before your eyes, an experience that can be explored as it was meant to be explored. Metal Gear Saga's fundamental idea its beauty lays on the surface of beauty of humanity of these games, which makes them not only memorable, but in some way immortal. Because they ask you through their character's story about most important questions of life. That's what makes them beautiful. That's what we cherish in them the most. And this is good, isn't it? So it also happened that way when I finished uploading the video, I got a notification that my Death Stranding disk has arrived. I've actually just popped the disk in the disk drive. So let's see what Kojima delivered to us with this one. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you for watching.